Our next panel is going to be focusing purely on Qatar's actions both here in the United States and abroad as it relates to their influence machine. We're joined by Ronald Sandy, a former senior, former senior analyst for the Dutch Military Intelligence Agency, and also an individual who was targeted by Qatari cyber espionage, Warren Litwin, the director, the assistant director of the Middle East Forum's Islamist and Politics Project, and someone who's written extensively on the Qatar Foundation International and also their influence here in both uh, higher education and also the think tank community, and Jim Hansen, the president and founder, co-founder of the Security Studies Group, also a former American Special Forces operator and someone who has written extensively about the Qatari influence campaigns here in Washington, D.C. So Warren will be focusing on their exposure to public institutions. Ronald will be focusing on their exposure internationally and also their cyber hacking and cyber espionage. And Jim will talk about their lobbying and also DC optics machine in terms of the war that's going on every day on social media and also in the broader press. We won't be touching on Al Jazeera or their global media empire because we're saving that panel for later on in today. So just to give some opening remarks. A range of Qatari lobbying, cyber espionage, and disinformation efforts against U.S. citizens and others around the world has been exposed in recent months. Some questions that we hope to be able to answer on this panel today include, should Foreign Agent Registration Act restrictions be tightened against Qatar and its agents in the U.S.? Some who register years late only after they're caught, either by think tanks like ours or by Justice Department investigators. How can we deal with Qatari-backed cyber warfare? Also, some actors here in the United States and overseas being accused of being involved in these pernicious campaigns. And lastly, we should answer the question, are the Qatari lobbyists winning? If they are, how do we turn that tide? And if they're not, what are some of the successful machines which have been used against their influence campaigns? So first, I'd like to start with Ronald and to ask you to give us an overview of what exactly is the infrastructure and the effect that the Qatari cyber espionage campaign has had in relation to two specific cases. The first, as it relates to the World Cup, and if there was anything that you could just give us a brief overview on that we didn't touch on Jamie's panel that we had covered beforehand. And second, what I mentioned in my opening remarks this morning, around 1,500 people from a whole plethora of different groups of individuals being targeted by um, Qatari hackers or Qatari-backed hackers. What's the purpose of that? What, what are they hoping to gain out of that? Oh, that's a whole lot. Uh, I, I, I can talk probably uh, hours about this, but let, let, let's start we'll try with try eight the, minutes. Yeah. So. <laughs> I will definitely be able to do that, cut some, uh, cut some edges. Um, I, th I think if, if we start first with the, uh, with, with the World Cup uh, football, I'm still from Europe, so I also use the word football. Football, you play with your feet, not with your hands. <laughs> but it doesn't matter, I still like American football uh, as well. Um, but, but without that, uh, what we saw in the, uh, in, in the, in, in the hacking with the, uh, uh, with the, with the World Cup, uh, the interesting part was as well that um, they were following mainly the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the influence streams and their, their dirty campaign to follow uh, the competition and take out the competition. Um, one of the interesting things as well is there that they were using their sovereign wealth fund. Um, one of the directors of uh, Qatari DR, uh, Ghanim bin Saad al Saad, uh, a businessman who is also uh, a Qatar Charity uh, Foundation uh, director for a long time. He um, was able to uh, give bribes to Brazilian and Argentinian uh, FIFA officials. And in return, he bought uh, an international chain of hotels, uh, five-star hotels in, 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 uh, in Monaco, in, in, in Nice, in Amsterdam, big hotels. Uh, he bought them for himself with his own company, and later on, he resold them to the uh, to the sovereign wealth fund with a, with, with an extra amount of cash for himself. Um, quite interesting. So they're using their their, their whole uh, scheme to um, get things done. And in in this uh, other hack, what we see really in in, in this current hack. Um, of 1,500 people, basically in 20 countries, uh, they go after everyone who is uh, opposition, uh, 
uh, they go after uh, people who are with them. Interestingly, very many Muslim Brotherhood operators are being targeted as well, uh, probably uh, for just control matters. And one of the very uh, most interesting things that I see currently is that they are following uh, a bunch of Arab soccer players, uh, young soccer players. One probably will think that they will try to use the information they get from those hacks in the World Cup 2022, maybe to bribe those players to lose a game. Um, there are interesting things, but, but in general, the, the Qataris just want control and they want to take out and know um, what their uh, op opposition is doing. In 2014, we saw that the Qataris were looking for their internal um, security and, and the communication security, and they decided not to go with the Chinese. They didn't trust them. They didn't want to go with the Russians. They didn't trust them, and they didn't go with the US because they didn't trust them either. So they were looking in Europe, and they decided not to use the Brits, untrustworthy as well for the Qataris, but they went with France. They went to Atos, uh, a, a big cyber firm, and they got the contract. So there is a lot going on, and um, the Qataris are very clever players. Um, they have a very tiny intelligence service, very active in uh, bribing and sponsoring uh, terrorist organizations. And their information that they are supporting uh, Al-Shabaab in Somalia, they're supporting Boko Haram in, uh, in, in Nigeria, and they're very much involved with uh, Al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb. Um, they do that in very interesting ways, uh, probably a little bit outside uh, this, this talk. Um, but what we really, really uh, see is that the Qataris are playing a very clever game. Um, as they are very small, they are hiring many British uh, former MI6, MI5, uh, GCHQ people uh, to do the bid for them in Qatar or in the UK. And they are following uh, also, um, yeah, many people in the U.S. So this is the examples where we find them succeeding in their hacking. But just in the last 24 hours, there's been five news stories that have come out. And I'd like to extrapolate on this and maybe have a little bit of a deeper yeah. dive to ask you for some reflection. Uh, the only positive news story that I saw, or maybe if we even go back 72 hours, is the Qatari uh, football team won the Asia Cup. And they made a very big news out of this. The second thing is they had a $10 billion investment that they made in a liquid natural gas terminal that was announced yesterday with the Secretary of Energy in Texas. So two positive stories. Three negative. One, a Barclays uh, executive in the United Kingdom is on trial right now for manipulating a bailout of the uh, British banks in the wake of the 2008 financial crisis. Qatar has now been implicated in that in trying to seek favorable conditions versus other bondholders. The second is an Amnesty International report that came out yesterday criticizing Qatari labor standards in the run-up to the 2022 uh, World Cup. And a third report that came out was the European Center for Constitutional and Human Rights, a German-based organization that was showing that it's not just about the, the labor issues in Qatar itself, but the standards that the Qataris have been exhibiting in their supply chain management as it relates to other non-stadium-based construction standards uh, going in Doha and also the supply chain outside the country. So there's, you know, a balance, I guess, between positive and negative news. All these reports just coming out 24 hours before a conference on Qatar in uh, Washington, D.C. Uh, not saying that there was any, uh, uh, you know, intention to be able to have that uh, collaboration or, or uh, causation of, of that story. But what is the reason that the Qataris are pursuing this when sometimes they get their hands slapped and other times they're rewarded? I mean, you would think that after being caught so many times that they would stop this activity. But what's the reason for them to continue it? Well, they find out money talks. Uh, quite simple. Um, if, if, if you do a good investment, probably good for the shareholders of Exxon and pretty good for Exxon itself. But should we be happy with a, with a big Qatari investment in something like that? It's part of, of Qatar's way of hedging and, and, and influencing uh, everyone. It's the soft power. Qatar has no real power. It needs soft power. How do you get, how do you get soft power? Well, you invest, you bribe, and you work with people. And, and, and in generally, that's what they do. We, it, they, these are all perfect examples of uh, hedging, and it's all about the brand of Qatar. And even more so, just going back to the World Cup for a second, uh, 
they were able to give favorable terms on a natural gas deal to Thailand. So we're not just talking about Europe and the Middle East and North America, but they went so far as to get the Thai vote on the FIFA decision, the FIFA executive committee to decide the World Cup by giving favorable terms on a natural gas deal, and they got the Thai vote. Now, I'm not saying that I can prove that, but if it just happened a few months beforehand, when they were getting unfavorable conditions years before that, they used every element of power at their disposal to try to get favorable conditions for their geostrategic aims. Now, um, yeah, and, and, and also, if I may say, they also worked so closely with Russia that they, they bought almost 20% of uh, Russia's uh, Rosneft uh, right. national oil company. So they made a deal together as well. And it seems like you made a point earlier when we were discussing this. Anywhere that there is a natural gas resource interest, the Qataris find some way to eject the competition or to take over the competition in order to gain a monopoly in those specific areas. Yep. So that's in terms of the area of natural resources and their cyber espionage. But there's over influence activity that's going on as well. Uh, Dr. Orrin Litwin from the Middle East Forum wrote a paper back in... Uh, January, I think, that was published in National Review in February or March, mm -hmm. on the example of Qatari <laughs> Foundation International. And this is before we found out that this organization was underwriting uh, the Jamal Khashoggi articles that were going out in the Washington Post prior to his untimely demise at the beginning of October. But QFI, the Qatari Foundation International, uh, has spent billions of dollars in the United States trying to influence not just colleges, that we know about through the reporting requirements under Title VI of the Higher Edu Education Opportunity Act, but also public schools and police departments. What are the Qataris doing funding K-12 through education, and how is that part of this wider influence strategy here in the United States? So just to set the scene, we've heard many times over the course of the last couple of hours that Qatar is a very small country with a tremendous amount of wealth in a very bad neighborhood. And they decided a couple of decades ago that their grand strategy going forward was to turn their wealth into influence. And we're going to hear different ways they've done that, like with Al Jazeera, and we've heard a few other ways through their uh, exploiting their natural gas uh, to, to forge these relationships and put themselves in the center of all these different relationships. But that means building a tremendous amount of, of um, soft power, as we've heard, with the major players in the region, and that includes the United States. And it's not just a matter of shelling out tons of money and now you like me, although they do that. It's also a question of, of building a certain tone, a certain set of relationships. And that's their objective in, in their involvement in the educational system here and in other parts of the world through the Qatar Foundation International. Now, the uh, QFI is a affiliate or subsidiary of QF, of the Qatar Foundation itself, which is a massive, massive nominally private but effectively state-run institution in Qatar which oversees their state development efforts. So uh, running uh, the universities in partnership with American universities who are richly paid to administer these, these satellite offices in, in Education City in, Do in the district in Doha. Um, <clears throat> and uh, I, th I think the number I saw was that Qatar has become the single highest funder of American universities out of all the other countries in the world. Uh, over a billion dollars since 2011. And they've done that mostly in order to fund these satellite uh, campuses in, uh, in Doha, but it also in involves reciprocal influence because the Qataris are also able to put their thumb on the scale here in the United States as far as what kind of decisions these universities like Georgetown, Texas A&M are, are making even here. Um, the QFI in particular, their, their, their mandate is a little more focused, theoretically, and their, their main focus, as they put it, is to facilitate the teaching of Arabic language and, in a larger sense, the Arabic and Muslim culture in the United States and other places in the world like uh, the UK, Brazil, uh, Germany. And, uh, and the way they've done that, they, they do that through two or maybe three different strains, depending on how you want to categorize it. One is teacher training and providing uh, resources, which I guess is, is two. Um, so curricula. Uh, instructional videos, uh, social media resources, all, and, and in particular, all these different training sessions in which uh, teachers of the Arabic language are, are given these resources provided more or less for free by QFI in order to be more effective in the classroom. That's number one. 
Number two is actually sponsoring Arabic language programs in different schools across the country um, um, and public schools in, in uh, competitive private schools, uh, different things like this. And the objective, that, um, I think their latest numbers were that they directly sponsor about 2,500 or 3,000 American students. So, so you'd ask them, you know, why are they doing this? I think what, one of the major goals of this is, is actually stated very explicitly by the emir who, who spoke about this. And I should mention that QFI, its, its leadership, the board of directors, is very heavily staffed with Qatari royals. The, uh, the CEO of, um, of QFI is Sheikha Hint bin Hamad, so, so the, um, so the uh, daughter of the previous emir. Um, they, they've got high-level uh, government officials on there, or, or previously did, like Khalid al-Khuwari, uh, al who was a major, uh, you know, his clan is very highly placed in Qatar. So, so this is clearly a very high profi uh, profile activity for the Qatari government, and their goal in this, as the emir said, was to spread good feeling through the teaching of language toward, uh, to, from the American people to Qatar and also to the greater Muslim world uh, in general. And why are they doing it? So this is facing two directions. Number one is influencing the United States. Number two is also positioning Qatar for the Arab world as their patron and their, their representative to the United States. And, and that's part of what they're doing with Al Jazeera, as you'll hear about. That's part of what they're doing with various other initiatives. So they're trying to seize the cultural leadership or the soft power leadership of the Arab world uh, through this. So you uh, had been in touch with the Arizona Department of Education, and you would reach out to local activists in Phoenix, encouraging their school district to not host this statewide convention sponsored or participated by uh, Qatar Foundation International. What was the response of people on the ground when you started sharing them some of the more nefarious activities of this foundation and who was backing them? Right, so, so Qatar Foundation International sponsored a uh, teacher, tra uh, teacher uh, continuing education uh, event which was uh, co-hosted with the uh, Council, uh, Arizona Council for the Social Sciences and Humanities, I believe. Um, and, and we actually had somebody who attended and who told us what happened. And uh, much of it was good information for Arabic language teachers. Some of it also was talking about the broader geopolitical context of the Middle East. And that's where the problem started. Because one of the major uh, themes of the, of the presenter was uh, Ms. Barbara Petson. One of her major themes was that this whole crisis between Qatar and its neighbors had nothing to do with the Muslim Brotherhood, and that, in fact, the Muslim Brotherhood was actually not an extremist organization. Why was it not an extremist organization? Because it wanted to rule society and then have a stable society. You see, all extremists want instability. Therefore, by definition, Muslim Brotherhood is not extremist. And that's almost literally what she said. <laughs> so this is... Um, so we hear this and we, we understand this is the kind of messaging that American school teachers who come to these events to learn more about the Middle East and then convey that to their students, this is the kind of messaging that they're getting. And so that's why we reach out to, to various activist groups on the ground in Arizona and in other states. Cutting a long story short, there are Freedom of Information Act requests and lawsuits going forward in Arizona and will be going forward in each of the 50 states of this country, getting more information about the kinds of teacher uh, training programs going on with QFI, how they came about, and what their content is. So just to give a little bit of an anecdote on that, there is a organization called Zahor, which is a legal, uh, not the defense fund, but a legal advocacy initiative that is um, right now involved in a lawsuit in Texas with the Texas Attorney General's office. Mm -hmm. Usually when a attorney would like to file a public information records request, they go in Texas to the office of the Attorney General, the office of, I think it's Public Information Awareness, and they ask for a university's records. It takes a few weeks or even a few months because of the bureaucratic nature of collecting all the documents. And usually there's no outside counsel that's necessarily involved in it. What happened when uh, this organization and their lead attorney sued for those information records on the $231 million, or it might be a little bit more, that Cutter had given to Texas A&M. So Squire Patton Boggs, which is a very high-powered attorney's office, who I'm sure most of the people in this room know uh, very well, uh, in DC, uh, they've been on Qatar's retainer since 1994. 
They've been probably, I, I think they're the longest lobbying relationship that Qatar has with any of the lobbying houses in this city. Uh, so Squire Patton Boggs filed suit again, uh, to block this Freedom of Information Act release, claiming that the information in the contract with Texas, uh, Texas A&M was actually proprietary and a trade secret because uh, their argument was that if the terms of this agreement were released, it would prejudice Qatar's bargaining position in trying to make similar agreements with other universities. Now, mind you, their, their agreement with Virginia, Virginia Commonwealth University, uh, which is another of these organizations that has a uh, satellite office in Education City, that one's already public because Virginia has much more stringent uh, disclosure laws and, uh, and VCU is actually a public university, so they had to release the terms of their uh, contract, which is very interesting. Qatar has a certain amount of, uh, or rather, the Qatar Foundation, because uh, of course it's not the Qatari regime, of course. Um, but it's owned by the Qatari yeah, regime. Yeah. Okay. Right. So we have to. Um, has, a, has a significant amount of influence over hiring decisions, directions of uh, direction of research, uh, certain administrative decisions, the budget of this uh, satellite office. In, uh, in Education City. So, and anyway, many of the terms of these sorts of agreements are already public, and yet Squire Patton Boggs is claiming that this particular agreement with Texas A&M is somehow uniquely um, damaging if it were released. And we'll see what happens with the result of that mm -hmm. lawsuit. And just to say to any Qataris that are watching, especially from QFI, you can expect 49 other lawsuits which will be coming <laughs> your foundation's way or with whatever universities that you are affiliated with, courtesy of the Middle East Forum and its partners. Uh, so, <laughs> maybe they don't have a relationship with Alaska or Idaho, but if you do, we'll find out. So, uh, not that I have anything against higher education in those states. Some of the finest American universities are in those places. But, but now linking from the Qatar Foundation International and its relationship with public education, we haven't talked about think tank influence, where we have uh, QFI, or maybe it's not through QFI, but we have the Qatari government or their interlocutors or their proxies giving tens of millions of dollars to uh, institutions like Brookings, I think. There's a great article, if you guys want to look it up, on danielpipes.org that looks over the history of foreign influence with think tanks. Daniel might be able to provide us with the link uh, in, in the interlude. Um, but I'll save that for a little bit later because I do want to talk about DC and use QFI as a segue to Jim Hansen, who he and his organization, including um, uh, Nick Short, David Reboy, um, Brad, I'm going to get his last name wrong. Brad Patty. Brad Patty and Jim have spent, I think, maybe the better part of the last year or the last two years doing an in-depth investigation and actually participating in the counter-information operations against this country. And, and you've been you know, achieving results. So can, can you maybe tell us a little bit about the Khashoggi, the QFI tie-in, and then expand the conversation of what exactly is Qatar doing here in Washington to, to try to influence American policymaking? Um, they're doing exceptionally well, we have to admit. I mean, by any reasonable standard, they're outstanding at both buying and obtaining influence through a number of ways. Um, obviously, money talks. And, you know, we heard how much the foundation has put out. We heard how much they pay the lobbying firms. We heard that Brookings is a wholly owned subsidiary of Cutter. <laughs> of Cutter Foundation Intention International. Yeah, if, if you I guys mean, look at their corporate records, let me cut yeah. you off, Jim. You will see that Brookings uh, Center Doha, if you look at the uh, entities mm -hmm. that Cutter owns with the chairman, I think it's in London where mm -hmm. you can find the corporate records. Brookings Center o o Doha is a 100% owned subsidiary of the Cutter Foundation or of the government of Cutter. So they probably didn't release that in their press release about getting the money from the country. But if you want to see those records, we can probably provide them to you, especially any media that's here. Mm -hmm. But sorry to cut you off. No, but and, and yet media still use Brookings as an independent authoritative source on stories where they are paid to have, you know, an opinion that's favorable to the Qataris. It's, uh, it's obscene. It's, it's impressive. I'll, I'll give them credit. You know, our, our, institute, our organization, Security Studies Group, we specialize in information operations and information warfare. We're somewhat unique in that. Uh, we have folks who come from that realm on both the military and intelligence side, and we use that expertise to watch how people can actually change a narrative 
through a number of means. Now, as we said, money is the easiest way. You know, you, you gain friends uh, by buying money. And, you know, the money we talked about is just what we know about. We have no idea how many satchels of cash were left under hotel tables, you know, all across the, the U.S., D.C., and throughout the Middle East and, and other places. You know, as, as a guy who aspires to own his own helicopter, I feel kind of cheated, you know, <laughs> that I haven't managed to pick any of those up. But we've never taken foreign money. You know, it's, it's one of the ways we're able to say we are a, an, an independent operator. They're not, and there are far too many people who are not. Um, one of the biggest stories of the past year that got an obscene amount of coverage, uh, f way disproportionate to the actual importance of it, was the murder of Jamal Khashoggi. Uh, the first win for the other side in this was calling him a journalist. He was not a journalist, he was never a journalist. When he was a newspaper person in Saudi Arabia, he worked for the previous regime and basically did propaganda for them, and we recently found out this week, was paid by Malaysia to run air cover for them while he was running an independent Saudi paper. He, he was the uh, media advisor to the intelligence minister, right? Uh, gee, and, the... but no, but he's a journalist. Oh, Greg, okay. get this correct. Right. You know, use All the right. proper terms because otherwise they won't get their money's worth out of this. Um, the Washington Post, you know, in bringing him into their house, either did zero due diligence or more likely just didn't care that for all intents and purposes, Khashoggi was a Qatari influence operator with a byline at the Washington Post. How valuable is that? I mean, that you just can't buy. All right, the Washington Post gave that to him. And honestly, at, at that point, they're either negligent or they should have filed a FARA you know, report for allowing him that. It came out that they were forced to admit because there were a number of sources, ourselves included, who were about to drop on them the fact that this was happening. When Khashoggi's apartment was raided after his death in Turkey, they found wire transfers from Qatar. All right, this was covered up by Turkish media. And in the course of the ensuing influence operation by Turkish media and aided by Qatar, they managed to create the entire media firestorm over this that lasted months. It was an incredibly successful uh, damage operation against the Saudis and chance for both Turkey and Qatar to gain leverage with the United States and with other countries. So they were, they were tremendously successful in doing that, and you know, we have to give them credit, but we should also pay attention, because that's, that's not something that we should be comfortable with. We should not be comfortable with the idea that a foreign country placed an information operator at a major US paper, one of the two biggest papers, you know, most important papers in the US, and fed him information, corrected his stuff, and the Washington Post ran it with, with not a disclaimer in sight, and everybody ate it up as if this was the truth. Well, I'm sorry, that's how democracy dies. Democracy dies through propaganda run by you know, supposedly independent journalistic sources. So that's, that's uh, give them an A plus for that. You know, they got away with that up until now, and now it's been exposed, but they're still not paying a price for it. Um, a second place that I think is important to note that Qatar has done a tremendous job in influencing the United States, and this is not criminal, this is just, again, good policy, is in great relations with the US military. All right, CENTCOM forward has been hosted there, the Alubaid Air Base, et cetera, and all the help they've given us uh, in counterterrorism operations has been tremendously successful in ingratiating themselves with our national security apparatus. The reason they're so helpful in counterterror operations is because they know all the terrorists because they fund them, all right? I mean, it's real easy for them to be able to say, hey, we're gonna help you take down some terrorists. These are some guys we don't like that our friends were funding told us are causing them trouble. Could you whack them? You know, could you drop a few drone strikes on them? Could you sanction them? Could you do whatever? They, they were the bag men when Obama bought Bo Bergdahl's release from the Taliban and the Haqqani network. All right, they're hosting our peace talks with the Taliban right now, not out of the goodness of their heart, but because the Taliban are their friends. They host their political offices. All right, they are deeply in bed with all the bad guys. And so they use us on both sides. They play us by helping and they use us as air cover for their malign influence to all the extremist groups around the world. So I think both of those things are, are tremendously damaging and I think it'd be nice if the world would pay a little bit more attention. So one of the uh, items that I focused in my initial remarks uh, when we began today was the highly successful uh, influence operation carried out with Qatari money 
but by non-Qatari lobbyists and agents. Mm -hmm. And I'm speaking specifically about the case of Stonington Strategies, uh, Nick Muzin, mm -hmm. uh, the former Deputy Chief of Staff to Senator Ted Cruz, and the former, uh, I believe, uh, Chief of Staff or Deputy Chief of Staff to Tim Scott, mm -hmm. and by Joey Alham, a uh, Syrian-born, New York uh, Jewish American citizen, uh, former restaurateur who's many uh, different, uh, you know, uh, uh, culinary, uh, uh, you know, I don't want to call them successes, but culinary ventures have since failed, and having them be the recipient of around $7 million in Qatari funds split between uh, two separate payments. I think there was $3 million and then $4 million, which was actually provided by a PR firm connected to the World Cup Dirty Tricks scandal, according to an article that came out in Mother Jones and also in, uh, I believe it was Tablet Magazine, written by Armin Rosen, had published something. And the idea here was that you had this individual, Muzin, and this other individual, Alaha, going to the American Jewish community to try to make uh, Qatar holier than, I guess, Kardawi, mm -hmm. uh, or holier than the Pope, <laughs> whatever we want to say. And, and they were trying to shop around, according to different legal filings that were made. None of this has been proven in court yet, so I want to be careful in what I said. They allegedly brought Qatari officials to major American Jewish organizations' annual fundraising dinners in order to buy goodwill and good favor with these individuals in September and October and November of 2017. Then, two months later, you have a delegation of individuals like Mort Klein from the Zionist Organization of America. You have Mike Huckabee, who ends up getting paid $50,000 to his firm for writing a nice column in, uh, or maybe tweeting something out nice that was done by them. Why don't I get paid by the tweet? <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> Well, Jim, we're, we're in the right side of the business because yeah. we go with our hearts rather than our pockets. But um, For now. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but then you have uh, Dershowitz go. He signs a legal contract with Alaham. Mm -hmm. And there's these two op-eds in the Washington Examiner and The Hill saying, you know, Qatar is like the Israel of the Gulf states. He's trying to hedge his Israel credentials on that. And then there's other American leaders. There's uh, Malcolm Holmline, who's, who's uh, said is going, and, and then Martin Oliner from the National Council for Young Israel, and a few other groups. Mm -hmm. Then you have FARA filings that come out on October 27th of 2018, which use articles highlighting these American Jewish and, and, and American Zionists, some non-Jewish leaders, going out to uh, Doha and saying, you know, the Qatari Airlines pajamas are really nice. <laughs> I think we have the journalists who got that quote in the audience here. We have um, quotes which are saying that uh, yeah, the Dershowitz articles appears in what's called a supplemental information packet. Uh, for anyone who's unfamiliar with the uh, Foreign Agent Registration Act filing process, you have your short form and your long form registration. And then you have what's called Exhibit A, B, and supplemental information. If anybody wants to go to find these documents, the original versions on the Department of Justice FARA website, just type into Google FARA filings or Department of Justice uh, FARA, and you'll see exactly what I'm talking about. So you have the articles highlighting the trips mm -hmm. of the uh, leaders going to Doha, being used in information, and then when you find what's on the lobbying agenda, every time they're speaking about what they're doing, they say, well, we can't call Qatar a sponsor of terrorism because we have American Zionist leaders going there. Why would they go if they were sponsoring Hamas? Why would they go if they didn't think that they were a solution for, uh, not modernity, but for moderation in the region if they didn't think this was connected to it? And then lo and behold, the legislation that was being pushed by many organizations you have in these lobbying filings under the Lobbying Disclosure Act, the LDA. You have APAC, you have the Anti-Defamation League, you have the American Jewish Committee, all pushing this anti-terrorism legislation, which was introduced by Brian Mastin, I think Josh Gottheimer was a Democrat co-sponsor on May 25th, 2017. It dies after these trips take place and these lobbying visits are done in, two, in, 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 uh, in uh, February and March of 2018. This is the legislation that Congressman Bergman called for to be reintroduced in this session of Congress. So knowing that story, to, <laughs> to remind you if you guys don't know about the, these details and, and for... Um,
before our panelists, how do you think, through a combination of uh, bribery, a combination of influence, and a combination of knowing how to run a DC machine, mm -hmm. do you think that future efforts can be detected? How do you think these people should be held to account who were participating in it? Were, were they just, um, you know, uh, uh, to use Lenin's term, uh, you know, useful idiots? Or were they actually part of the, uh, you know, process here and they knew what was going on? What, what's your opinion? I'd like to get each response, maybe starting think, with Jim and, and then moving down. they would qualify as fellow travelers and useful idiots. You know, and again, money talks. So as soon as you start laying out enough, you know, people judge, oh, that's, that's too small. That's just a briefcase full of cash. I'm looking for a full satchel or a roll-on bag at this point. Uh, and, you know, they've done that. But what they did in this case was they were smart about who they targeted. You know, they, they decided what we need is air cover of a different side. We need Jewish leaders to say that Qatar's not bad. And the whole idea, again, back to the, the point that Qatar doesn't just finance most of the bad guys around, Hamas, Hezbollah, you know, Al-Qaeda, everybody. They, they, they throw money around to all of those organizations so they can control them. You know, and, and they are very, very Muslim Brotherhood centric. You know, you pick a bad guy, they're in bed with them. But then in order to cover for that here and to make sure that the U.S. doesn't do anything more in the way of sanctions and other things against them, they picked very influential Jewish leaders, which is, it, it's horrifying. You know, it's horrifying to think that they're, first of all, they're that good at it. And second of all, that those people were gullible enough to go ahead and fall for something like this. And the way you, you do it in the future is right now we have one advantage, all right? The left started this massive Trump-Russia winch hunt which focused on Farrah filings because that's what they've got on Manafort. Paul Manafort was deficient in every way in Farrah filings. Now, the idea that you can be a foreign agent and not register, it's almost impossible. You're really opening yourself up to difficulty. So it's gonna be more, more difficult in the future for Qatar and other people who want to just buy influence to do so without it being disclosed. Now, the second problem is the media is not going to cover it if it doesn't fit their narrative or agenda. So it's going to take alternative media. It's going to take you know, other ways to get things out, social media. And, and we have a burgeoning conservative media now that I think is well represented here and other places that will actually talk about these stories. But those two things have to combine disclosure and transparency and then exposure and distribution of the stories about these type of influence operations. Okay. Now, Ron, maybe you can comment on the American context, but I also know you've done extensive research into the manipulation and political trickery that the Qataris have done outside the United States, like the Sarkozy case mm -hmm. in France. Yeah. Um, now, I, I, I think one of, the, uh, one of the problems here in the U.S. is, is there should be better enforcement of the FARA Act. Um, if, if, if government would really go after them and edit and audit, more or less, uh, the, 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 the lobbying firms, and the law firms on, on this issue, I think we would, they would be way more careful and they would be way more willing to, uh, to announce that they are uh, that they're working with foreign countries. I think that's one point. And, and on the Europe case, um, <clears throat> first, first a, a very small anecdote about how the, uh, how the Qataris work. When the French entered Mali in, I believe, 2014, uh, the French found a lot of documents in, a, in, a, in an abandoned house and in a mosque. And from those documents, they really learned that it was the Qataris um, who had told organizations like Boko Haram and Al-Qaeda in the Islamic Maghreb to kidnap French citizens. What was the reason behind it? It would be a win-win for both. Um, the, the Qataris would go to, to the French and say, hey, you never pay for, uh, for hostages. We will, we will take care of that for you. So the hostage was being paid for by the Qataris. The hostage was sent to France. France could officially say, hey, we, we didn't pay for them. And the Qataris basically already had communicated before with the terrorist organizations, okay, we will have to fund you, but let us do it in this way so we get the benefits from the rest and we can still fund you guys. So it's typically hedging uh, operation what they were doing. They were doing that with, with French family who was being kidnapped in Cameroon. They did that in, the, uh, in Mali. They did it in, in multiple countries. Um, the French were, uh, pretty angry when they learned about this. And I really heard that the French Minister of Defense at that moment, uh, within a day when he heard this, he flew to Doha and said some awful words I cannot mention here. But um, it starts with, with an F and it ends with an F. Uh, and, and he flew back. Um, 
But what we really saw in France, how the, how the, how the Qataris are, are, are working and influencing is, um, especially French President Sarkozy, who, who also has a second house in Morocco, next to, in, in the same quarter where the, uh, where the Qatari Emir has his uh, big $92 million uh, palace in Casablanca. Um, interesting. And also some other uh, high-risk players are uh, very close to them there in, in Casablanca. They, they, um, um, the French president is involved in multiple scandals, being paid off in multiple ways. But one of the things was that um, his favorite soccer team, Paris Saint-Germain, was uh, pretty bad, in a pretty bad state. And he asked the Qataris to take over. Well, we really see what happened now. Um, the Qataris bought it. They bought some big players from Barcelona. Interestingly, a former um, president of Barcelona is also uh, the head of the Aspire uh, uh, Sports Academy in, in, in Doha. So it was not too difficult to get Neymar uh, as a soccer player. But there, there's all this kind of murky business going on. And they don't, do it, they don't do it in the US. They do it in France. They do it in the UK. And they buy multiple uh, uh, big stakes in companies. They also do a lot of... Uh, buying of real estate uh, for high prices, and yeah, they're they're buying off generally Europeans as they do it here in the U.S. So, Warren, what's your take in terms of the way in which they're wielding the power of their philanthropic uh, ventures? And, and I want to quote an article that I mentioned beforehand that was on DanielPipes.org about Brookings' relationship with Cutter, and then maybe try to. Um, offer a, paral a parallel geopolitical event that took place about four or five years ago and how this may have made sense. So um, Daniel writes, some of this funding has been given clandestinely with think tanks taking money under the table, sorry Jim, you didn't get in on that, uh, while benefiting from a moral image of disinterestedness. In the most prominently egregious example, the government of Qatar, as the New York Times reported, and I quote, funneled hundreds of millions to Hamas-led Gaza and encouraged its rocket and tunnel assault on Israel, and also signed a four-year, $14.8 million deal in 2013 to fund the Brookings Institution, where Martin Indyk served as vice president and director of the foreign policy program. Indyk worked for Secretary of State John Kerry from July 2013 to June 2014 as special envoy for Israeli-Palestinian negotiations. And Daniel asks this question, he says, as someone on the same payroll as is Israel's mortal enemy, how could Indic be expected to act in a neutral way? So what other examples are you familiar with? And it's specifically as it relates to the Israeli-Palestinian the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. And you have someone who's the head of foreign policy programs going to become the special envoy for that conflict, while the Qataris all at the same time are funneling hundreds of million dollars hundreds of millions of dollars to a terror organization which is pledged to its enemy, in this case, Israel's destruction. Right, and it's, it's worth pointing out, um, we've heard a couple of times that uh, Qatar is one of the major funders of Hamas in the, uh, in the Gaza Strip. And to a certain degree, if you're going to fund Gaza, you're going to fund Hamas anyway, just because of the nature of the way that they've taken over all of the, uh, all of the social services in Gaza. But, and, and so the, the, the plausible deniability aspect is that Qatar is saying, well, look, we want to ameliorate the situation in Gaza, therefore we need to give money to aid organizations. They happen to be controlled by Hamas, and that's just you know, the way things are. Um, our argument is that actually the fact that you're giving the money to Hamas first allows them to use that money in order to advance their interests rather than the, than the interests of the Gazan people. So, that, so, so even though they're, they're presenting it as a philanthropic, a philanthropic relationship, ultimately it's about maintaining their influence with Hamas, and again, maintaining their role as a power broker in the region. And, and one other point I wanted to make is that you know, we know a lot of their influence operations in the United States, specifically because of FARA, because of the, the disclosure requirements that we have in place to do that. The problem is, as, as was said, is that it's not strictly enforced enough. So the QFI, for example, it began its life in, two, uh, in 2007 as a public nonprofit that had to file disclosures with the IRS, Form 990, if, if, if you know. Um, in 2011, they restructured, so they were now a private entity, no longer had to disclose anything they were doing to the IRS or to anybody else. Uh, 
And that's an example where they're, they're actively working to thwart transparency, uh, whereas, as we've heard, the more transparency we have in, in the operations of Qatar and its, its various uh, affiliates and agents, you know, the, the better picture we have about who is doing what to whom and how that affects us. So I want to follow up with one thing, Oren, here. Mm -hmm. I mentioned beforehand that it's K through 12, it's public universities, uh, but also police departments, where there's been training initiatives which have been funded by QFI for sensitivity training towards uh, these anti-Islamophobia uh, uh, outreach efforts to the American Muslim community. And it's not organic insofar as American Muslims are approaching police departments and saying, hey, let's like to work together. This is an example. I, when I used to work in Pittsburgh as the head of interfaith relations for the Jewish Federation there before I began this job at the Middle East Forum. You would go to the mosque, you would say, hey guys, let's have a good relationship, let's talk, let's uh, have a, you know, an iftar dinner here, or we'll do a Passover seder there, whatever else. In the context of interfaith relations, in the local context, it was very organic. But here's QFI coming from their Washington, D.C. office, bypassing local American Muslim communities and saying, here's a curriculum that we think that you should use. Here's a program that we think you should use as American police officers that says the following. One, Islamophobia is something that is uh, defined by an institution like Georgetown, for instance. Uh, Texas A&M. Texas A&M, which is it's another one. Uh, you know, we, we haven't talked about the institutions or the programs that the Qataris are funding at this. Maybe you can give us an example of Georgetown's uh, professors that are receiving some of this support, whether directly or indirectly. I know it's a Saudi program, but they still get mm -hmm. support there. Perhaps an example of Carnegie Mellon University, which has a campus in Doha. If anyone wants to see the parallel between Carnegie Mellon and Qatar, Carnegie Mellon is the number one computer science school in the United States. It's not a surprise that someone at the forefront of cyber hacking would want to have that intellectual property in Doha. So maybe you can give us an example. Right. So, so Georgetown has a satellite office in, uh, in Education City. They're paid you know, hundreds of million dollars a year to run it. Uh, did it with Car Carnegie Mellon. Um, and, and what you were alluding to about the Islamophobia, it, it points out something which I didn't discuss in great detail uh, in my write-up, but we found that among the... Uh, faculty of QF schools in, in Qatar itself are a number of, of intellectuals who are linked to the uh, IIIT, the International Institution for uh, Islamic Thought, uh, which is a, essentially it's, it's uh, you, could, you could look at it as a Muslim Brotherhood uh, uh, think tank in the United States. Um, and one of the major initiatives of the IIIT was actually to create this concept of Islamophobia and to publish it. Uh, they, um, it goes back to a uh, a, a paper that they wrote, I think, in the late 80s. But they're, they're, they're on the forefront of the, of the wave which was taken up by other American Islamist organizations to push Islamophobia as a frame in which to view all this. And the fact that Qatar is continuing to, to you know, work on that angle with American police uh, institutions here is not a complete surprise, given that. Right. It's okay to criticize Islamists, but no one's criticizing American Muslims. Well, and that's, if you look at what's happening in the Gulf right now, all right, you've got Saudi Arabia is modernizing, right? MBS stopped, you know, basically any operations by the extremist clerics, you know, cracked down on the Muslim Brotherhood and everything they're doing. Uh, the Emiratis are doing similar things. And then you've got Qatar fronting for the Brotherhood and trying to push them, paying people like Khashoggi and others to, to publicize that and trying to create a fear of talking about it, and then also the idea that the Brotherhood is a charitable organization, like Hezbollah and the other helpful people they do, who, okay, occasionally may drop a pile of food someplace, but are more likely to drop a pile of ammunition or a suicide vest, you know, for somebody to use. So they've been very cagey about, you know, trying to, to oppose the efforts from the rest of the Gulf states to actually create a modernized, non-Islamist society. And I think that's horribly damaging. That might be the worst thing to do. You know, the extremist groups and the rest, the terrorism is awful. But when you are actually fighting modernization that's happening, and that was part of you know, the effort by Khashoggi to you know, use his death against the Saudis, was because they wanted to stop MBS and the things that were happening there that were against their request and their entire goal of supporting the Brotherhood and creating Islamist-focused societies. And I think that's an area where their charm offensive 
by the Qataris needs to backfire because in the end, they're trying to progress backwards in a region that right now has an opportunity to actually move forward. So the, the charm offensive with the West provides cover for building Islamist movements in the Middle East. Absolutely. And that's, that, that might that's be answering this question of well, why are they doing that's this? Why, that's exactly why they're doing it. And they've been tremendously successful because they, they couch it in all these other things. They couch it in charity. They couch it in education. They couch in these other things. Yet right behind all of those is what's the curriculum? What is the goal? And in the end, if you watch what they're doing, they're not, they're not just helping those organizations. They're helping Iran, for God's sakes. You know, they're, they're in bed again with all the worst people for the worst reason possible at a time when we actually have a possibility of a generational change. As mentioned, 60% of the, the population in the Gulf Arab states is under 30, all right? Those people are not by nature nearly as Islamist as the old school people. So while you've got a guy like MBS trying to make this change happen, you've got the Qataris trying to torpedo it and that's you know, the feud that's going on in the Gulf. And that's why their relations with the Department of Defense and Department of State are so important, because when they can get those U.S. organizations to try to mediate this in a way that lets the Qataris back into good you know, relations with us and with everyone else, um, they succeed in slowing down that pace of modernization and pushing their Islamist agenda. Right. So we've talked a lot about the ills and the, the discontent of Qatar and, and its influence operations. I'd like to get one policy recommendation on education, on international outreach, and in Washington, D.C., that can help us end uh, the panel on a high note. What can we do if we have members of uh, congressional staff here, members of the media? Uh, what would you say is a policy recommendation that you would make to the Congress or to the executive branch to be able to help start peeling back this onion and to, to expose this, this, uh, this influence machine and to start holding them accountable? Or I would say enforcing FARA against QFI because they very clearly crossed the line just from teacher training to teacher influence and from there inf influencing uh, the classroom. And also, we've seen it's, uh, instances where QFI was directly sponsoring American political institutions like the, uh, the Arab American Community Association of New York back when Linda Sarsour was uh, the executive director, which kind of goes a little bit out of their lane. So anyway, FARA. So Cutter's backing Sarsour? For Was a, we, we, there's very little information, and that's what Pharaoh would solve. Okay. Right. Uh, I, I would basically say uh, it's very important, especially in, in European countries as well, um, to stop funding religious institutions from abroad. Um, I know in the, in the West it's very difficult to say uh, we cannot allow um, people from abroad not to funding churches or I don't know what kind of organizations, but Basically, we see the right now that Qatar is, is so, and, and Turkey are so actively using um, this fact to, to uh, fund uh, and, and, and build new mosques, basically all focused on Muslim Brotherhood or wars, and that they are taking over, trying to take over Muslim communities in, in multiple countries. And they're getting away with a lot of it as European intelligence <laughs> services. Yet, yeah, Muslim Brotherhood is not our priority in the, in the number 10 list. So um, that would be very good if there would be legislation um, in, uh, being, being uh, brought up in, in multiple countries just to stop uh, foreign funding of religious institutions. Jim? I would say there's a pretty good question right there. <laughs> are they still as good an ally or are they at this point becoming a strategic threat? I mean, it's a similar question we need to ask about Turkey. I think we're coming to a, a better resolution. That's uh, June's conference. Yeah, yeah. we so will, we will we'll skip that. There. But the point being, when you look at who our allies are, um, it's not a question of historically, have we been you know, friendly with the Qataris? Do we have uh, military uh, interoperations with them? Do we want you know, everyone in the Gulf to get along? Yeah. But is that something we should put ahead of what they're doing to undermine U.S. strategic interests around the world. And I think if we want them to be a U.S. ally, they have to change their ways. You know, there's just no question that their malign activities are far too extensive to get a pass simply for hosting an airbase. There's a lot of flat places in the Middle East we could land planes. You know, I'm pretty sure <laughs> that is not the only place we could do that. Yet we just signed a pact to go ahead and, 
you know, upgrade Alameda Air Base, okay? Which they're well, paying for. Which they're paying for, which is another way to say money talks. All right, and nothing wrong with that, all right? There's nothing wrong with that if it's transparent, if we know what's happening, and if it's not counter to U.S. strategic interests. So let's take a look at those, and if we're going to continue to let those things happen, then we need to make sure they're in ways that make them a U.S. ally, not a uh, problem. And I think that my recommendation would be that currently foreign countries are required to register the amounts and very small bits of information as it relates to their funding of both uh, institutions of higher education to a certain extent K through 12 schools depending on the state's rules. I'd like to see greater transparency in all foreign funding of nonprofit organizations, especially think tanks that have to be exposed by the New York Times to find out what it is that they're coming with but also 501c3, 501c4 organizations, 501c6 trade promotion organizations, and anyone that is involved in the realm of trying to affect American public opinion as it deals especially with foreign affairs, but also domestic issues that foreign institutions try to meld in their own unique character, whether it be for positive purposes or for, in this case, malign purposes. So in the cases of public institutions, Warren, thank you for your presentation. Ron, as it relates to our international experience and being able to understand the global reach of this influence operation, I appreciate your contributions. And Jim, thank you for shining a light, not just on Khashoggi, but on the wider DC implications and the purpose and the intent of what the Qataris are trying to do here in Washington. Uh, we will end this panel now at 12 o'clock on the dot. We will reconvene at 12.30 for uh well now we'll have lunch hmm. but um we'll reconvene at 12 30 for remarks from another member of congress and then we will continue our afternoon part of this program thank you Good.